I was in Harbor Freight the other day, pretending everything there was beneath me, when I suddenly spotted what appeared to be a reasonable copy of a Stanley number no. 4 smoothing plane. Really? This appears to have all the same parts as this. So, is this a sow's ear or a silk's purse? And if it is a sow's ear, can we make it into a silk purse? Let's unpack it and find out. Well, <laughs> to begin with, uh, the packaging that this plane comes in doesn't give me much hope. Uh, the folks from Central Forge call this a jack plane, when uh, plainly, this is a copy of a smoothing plane. Now, just so you know what I'm talking about, and for the education of anyone from Central Forge or Harbor Freight who may be watching, this is my collection of Stanley bench planes. Now, a bench plane is a two-handed plane where the cutter is mounted bevel down. You have smoothing planes for surface preparation, jointer planes for truing the surface, and jack planes when you need a plane that will swing both ways. Stanley gave each of its bench plane numbers. The smoothing planes that I have here are numbers three, four, and four and a half. The main difference between these planes is the width of the iron. This iron is one and three quarter inches wide, two inches, and two and three eighths. The jointer planes that I have, are number six and seven, both have two and three eighths inch irons. The main difference between these planes is the length of the whole sole. The number six has an 18 inch uh, long sole, the number seven, 22 inches. The jack plane has a two inch iron and a 15 inch sole. Now, there are other bench planes that aren't shown here. The most obvious admission is number one and two. Uh, most craftsmen, myself included, consider these toys. There just isn't enough room behind the iron for me to wrap my fat fingers around the handle or the tote. There's also a number eight with a 24 inch long sole. Uh, and I just don't have the room in this shop for the tractor you need to drag that much iron across a piece of wood. Heck, uh, I have to get Travis to lift up the other end of the number seven when we take it down from the shelf. The most popular planes in this lineup was the number four smoothing plane and the number five jack plane. Woodworkers and cabinet makers seemed to find more use for the number four, while carpenters were more likely to carry around a number five in their toolbox because it walked the line between smoothing and joining. The central forge plane is obviously a smoothing plane. As you can see, it's a knockoff of the Stanley number four. Smoothing plane, not a jack plane like the packaging claims. Well, that must seem like a lot of effort just to prove that the uh, guy who wrote the packaging got it wrong. But if you're going to get this thing to work, you've got to understand what it was intended to do. And uh, speaking of which, let's see what it does straight out of the packaging. Uh, first of all, let's take the old Stanley number 4 and show you what it's supposed to do. There you go. Paper thin curls, leaving a beautifully smooth surface. Now, let's adjust the cut here. Looks like the uh, iron is buried. That's it. Okay, it's just barely protruding. I did nothing but scrape. Give it a little bit more, uh, more protrusion. Well, it's doing nothing but scraping and not a very good job of scraping. So this is going to take some serious tuning. Let's break this down so we can see how much work we have to do. I'm going to uh, disassemble. Uh, both the Central Forge plane and the old Stanley number four, so we can compare the parts as we go. Now, the first pieces to come off are the lever caps. Yeah. 
As you can see, Central Forge tried to reproduce uh, the uh, iconic kidney-shaped slot that Stanley has been using since the 1930s, uh, but uh, their kidney looks uh, somewhat diseased. And if you turn these over, well, the difference between the quality of the uh, castings becomes even more apparent. There's a lot of work we're going to have to do here with a round file, uh, maybe even some sort of kidney transplant. Next, let's take a look at the chip breaker and the plane irons. Uh, the uh, plane iron is the cutter, and the chip breaker is what rolls up the shavings to make those nice little curls. I'm going to take the uh, chip breaker off the plane iron. Oh, look at that. Uh, the chip breaker on the central forge plane is wider than the plane iron and doesn't quite fit between the sides of the sole so there's a little bit of grinding to do there. Yeah, let's take a look at these side by side. The uh, first thing I notice is that the central forge chip breaker is a lot thinner than the uh, old Stanley and uh, this could be a problem. This machine bolt here that they uh, use to fasten the chip breaker to the plane iron, uh, on the Stanley there's two full threads. It's that thick. Uh, on the central forge, yeah, just like I thought, just only one thread. So we're going to have to be careful when we fasten the plane iron and the chip breaker together. If we get this too tight, it could strip out that single thread. Okay, let's take a look at the plane irons. Uh, well, actually they look pretty substantial. If I mic the Stanley, I get a plane iron that's 75 thousandths of an inch thick. And if I mic this one, whoa! 86, almost 87 thousandths. So, they gave us a little extra metal there. That's good. We might need it. Um, the uh, surface is extremely rough. You can see it isn't anywhere near as smooth as the old Stanley. Uh, and the, uh, the edge is as dull as old shoes. You do not want me doing that same test with the Stanley. There would be blood everywhere. Uh, I don't know what metal that these things are made out of. I do know this one. This is high-grade tool steel. But there is absolutely no indication on the packaging or the instructions from Central Forge as to what metal this uh, uh, plane iron is made out of. However, there are some tests we can do that will give us an idea, and uh, we'll do those when we get to sharpening this. The frog that beds the chip breaker and the uh, plane iron to the sole appears to have some of the same problems as the lever cap. Apparently no one at Central Forge ever learned how to remove flashing. That's the uh, metal that leaks between the surfaces of a mold or a die when they do the casting. Uh, take a look at the uh, old Stanley frog. Uh, nice and clean. Uh, the slots that allow you to adjust the frog back and forth uh, closes down the mouth of the plane or opens it up. Those are nice and crisp. Uh, and here, uh, not so much. A lot of work there that we're going to have to do with a, a file in order to get that to slide smoothly. Uh, furthermore, some of the surfaces that should be machined and made smooth aren't. So there's even more work to do with the file. And see this little tab here at the end of the uh, frog or at the bottom? Uh, this tab fits over a slotted machine bolt and allows you to slide the frog back and forth with precision. Uh, see how substantial that tab is on the old Stanley? It's uh, much, much thinner on the central forge plane. Uh, so that means that we're going to have to clean up these slots and be careful to have those uh, machine bolts loosened when we attempt to adjust the position of the frog. Otherwise, we'll risk bending that tab. 
the back handle or the tote on this uh, central forge plane and the front knob are made from plastic. No surprise there. The, uh, the tote and the knob on the newest Stanleys are also made from plastic, although the ones from this old Stanley are made from rosewood. Uh, once again, the folks at Central Forge appear to be absolutely blind to flashing. You can feel the seams in the molds on these handles, and that will become annoying if you have a lot of cleaning to do. Uh, so I'm going to have to take a very sharp knife and carefully trim the flash away from the tote and the knob. You know, the amount of work we have to do here is becoming less like a tune-up and more like a rebuild. We're finally down to the sole, the uh, whole foundation of the planes. And here again, the quality in castings uh, just jumps out at you. On the old Stanley, all the lettering and the bosses are nice and crisp. We're here in the uh, Central Forge casting, well, you can barely read that that says number four. Everything is rounded over and filled in. And there are some parts that just aren't there. You see this Y-shaped yoke here? This boss right here is what guides the frog as you uh, move it back and forth to uh, close down the mouth or open it up. And here it's completely missing, which is <laughs> weird because the frog itself is notched to accept a guide that isn't there. Go figure. Uh, this will make it a little harder to align the cutting edge with the leading edge of the mouth when you close down the mouth or open it up, uh, but not impossible. And speaking of the mouth, uh, the uh, the front or edge or leading edge isn't quite parallel to the back, so there's a little work to do there with a the file. Let's see whether or not the sole is flat. Now, it's slightly arched from toe to heel and, ooh, badly cupped from side to side. Ah, you know, a friend of mine bought uh, one of these and found exactly the same problems. Uh, in fact, he bought three, one after the other, and they all were arched and cupped. So that indicates a manufacturing problem. So there's a lot of lapping to do here. Since the most important task in tuning a plane is sharpening the iron, let's start with that. Uh, after all, if we can't get this sharpened, then the rest of this is just so much scrap iron, along with a healthy dose of plastic. Now, ideally, we'd like this to be high carbon tool steel, since tool steel holds a cutting edge for a long, long time. Other forms of steel, mild steel and most uh, stainless steels, are just too soft to hold a cutting edge. Now, there are some tests we can do to figure out what this might be. Uh, five, in fact. Let's start with examining the blade and looking at the color. Most tool steel is silvery and shiny. All other forms of steel are a dull gray. And this certainly is dull, although the dullness could be the result of the uh, rough ridges left by the, uh, by the grinding. This might uh, shiny up quite a bit once I, uh, once I polish it. Next, let's see if we can put a scratch in it. I have here a scraper that I know is, uh, is a quality tool steel, and it's uh, been tempered so that it's very, very hard. Well, I can put some mild scratches in it, but it's actually pretty hard stuff. That's a good sign. Next, let's try a magnet. Ooh, that's another good sign. Uh, magnets won't stick to most forms of, to, of uh, stainless steel. Although, there is a type called martensitic, uh, which uh, is used for knives and cutting edges where the magnet does stick. So we're not out of the woods yet. Let's try a spark test. For this test, I've removed the cage from the grinder so that we can see the spark pattern. We're looking for the color of the spark, how far the grinder throws the spark, and whether the sparks fork, the pattern will appear bushy when they do. Let's start with a piece of mild steel. This angle iron is made of just that.
the sparks were sort of a yellowish orange. Uh, the grinder threw the sparks almost the full length of the, uh, the workbench, and there wasn't much forking, really not much bushiness to the pattern. Not like you'll see when I do this old uh, worn out file, because this is made from really good tool steel. The spark pattern is much whiter. Uh, the sparks don't go as far. They uh, only go maybe a third to halfway across the workbench. And there's a lot of bushiness, a lot of forking and bursts going on inside that uh, spark pattern. Let's take uh, this hex bolt. This is made of stainless steel. was undramatic. Uh, not much sparking at all. It seems that when they uh, replace the carbon in the stainless steel with chromium, it really dampens the spark pattern. So, drum all, let's do the uh, central forge plain iron. a pleasant surprise okay uh, now this still could be Martin Siddick stainless steel but it has a pattern very close to that of uh, tool steel there's one more test that we got to do I took a paper towel I wet it and then I wrapped the plain iron in it and let it sit overnight now if this is tool steel there should be some surface rust and there isn't so taken everything else together, I'm pretty sure this is Martin Siddick stainless steel. Now that's not great news, but it's not bad news either. There are some things that we can do during the sharpening process to get a really good cutting edge on this. Now that we have some idea of what we're dealing with, uh, let's uh, smooth the back of the plain iron so that it slides easily over the frog. Um, now remember, the plain iron is mounted bevel down, so the back is actually the surface where you can see the plain iron. Now because this is so rough, I'm going to do this on a belt sander. It would take me just forever to do it by hand. And to protect my fingers, I'm going to use a magnet to hold it. This magnet is part of a dial caliper. I just remove the caliper, put the magnet on the iron, Throw the little, le little lever, and there we go. I'm just going to uh, smooth this with 100 grit. There's no sense in going any finer. This isn't part of the cutting edge. Um, 100 grit will make this smooth enough that it will slide easily. Okay, that's, uh, that's smooth enough. There's still some ridges there at the top, but they won't interfere at anything. Now, I'm going to give this a chance to cool off, and we'll do the same thing with the back. All right, with the back and the front relatively flat, it's time to move to my sharpening rig. Now, this is a pastry stone, a piece of marble that's been ground perfectly flat and then polished. Uh, it's perfect for uh, sharpening plain irons and lapping plain soles. You just stick down a piece of sandpaper and wade in. I've attached uh, two sanding belts here. This is a 120 grit and this is 240 grit. I'll start with this. Well, it's been a day or two since I tried uh, flattening this plain iron to get it ready for the sharpening process. I worked back and forth between the pastry stone and the belt sander, and at the end of about five hours, I had removed four thousandths of an inch of thickness 
from the plane iron, and still these two corners here were recessed below the area that I had flattened. Well, at the end of a very frustrating day, a friend of mine, Jim McCann, uh, the chief engineer for Shopsmith, dropped by and I explained to him what I was trying to do here. Well, Jim has access to a surface grinder, so we packed up all the plane irons and uh, headed for his shop. And uh, along the way, we bought a second uh, central forge plane so we could compare the two plane irons and see if the problems I was having were common to just this plane iron or were possibly uh, something that you'd experience in all the central forge irons. Jim started by testing the hardness of the irons to see if they were consistent, and they were. Depending on where he tested it on each iron, it registered between 56 and 62 on the Rockwell C scale of hardness. Just for comparison, the Stanley iron registered between 61 and 59. So, these are probably pretty good quality pieces of steel. Well, then we put them on the surface grinder and we had exactly the same problems with the corners that I had experienced. Jim had to remove eight thousandths of an inch from this iron, the one that I'd already been working on to get it perfectly flat, and ten thousandths of an inch from this iron. Jim's take on this is this is a manufacturing problem. In all probability, the folks at Central Forge ground the bevel on these irons before they did the surfacing. The surfacer actually bent down the corners where the iron had been weakened. Had they done the bevel after the surfacing, they might have actually produced a good iron. Thanks to Jim, we now have a flat plane iron and we know that it's a good piece of steel. So let's forge on. I'm going to continue honing the front, working my way up from 120 grit all the way to 600 grit. And as I do so, I'm going to keep checking that the plane iron remains flat and also that there is a shine that develops. I'm going to stop at 600 grit even though there's a little more work to do. But I'm going to wait until I've got the bevel up to the same place. To condition the bevel, first I'm going to regrind this at 35 degrees. Now I know most woodworkers choose between 25 and 30 degrees uh, for the cutting angle on their plane iron but 35 degrees should be fine. As long as there's a relief angle between the bevel and the wood, it'll cut just fine. Now I've chosen this larger than normal a cutting angle because stainless steel is notoriously hard to sharpen. It's much tougher than uh, tool steel and it doesn't grind away as fast. The 35 degree angle has some extra meat in it and this will resist wear and extend the time between sharpening. Both the bevel and the front surface have been honed to 600 grit. Now I'm going to switch sandpaper to 1500 grit and I'm going to hone the bevel. Then, without taking the iron out of the guide, I'm going to flip it over and hone the front. This not only makes the edge keener, it removes any burr that might have developed while honing the bevel. Finally, I'm going to get rid of the sandpaper altogether. Make sure the stone is relatively dry and replace it with regular paper. Then I'm going to rub this paper with polishing compound, just like I was coloring it with a big crayon. Uh, then I'm going to polish the bevel and the front, just like I did with sandpaper. There's the mirror finish I'm after. Let's test this. Let's see how it cuts. <laughs> I think this just might work. Now we have to flatten the sole of this bench plane. And like I said, it was pretty badly arched and cupped. So I'm going to do the initial flattening on this belt sander using a 100 grit belt. All right, that's as good as I can get it on a belt sander. So let's go back to the pastry stone. I'm going to use the uh, sanding belts again, 120 grit, 240 grit. And to monitor my progress, I'm going to draw some lines across the sole with the Sharpie. Now as I work, 
the lines will slowly be removed. When I remove them all, I'll know this thing is as flat as I can possibly get it. Go. The sole is uh, dead flat and feels pretty smooth. You'll notice all the marks are gone. I'm just finishing up here on a piece of 320 wet dry to give it a little shine. The smoother the sole, the less at work it is to uh, push it across a piece of wood. When you've got the sole as smooth and as flat as you want, Take a file and round over the edges where the sole meets the wood. This will keep it from digging in and possibly scratching the wood. Wax. Finally, wax the sole after you finish lapping and filing. This will keep it from rusting. Okay, now we have to do all that filing I mentioned when we were tearing this plane apart. Generally, we have to remove all the flashings smooth some surfaces, shape some slots, and generally make sure that the parts fit together properly. While filing and reshaping the parts, I found two more problems that are going to need our attention. First of all, the chip breaker doesn't meet the plane iron the way it should. Uh, the front edge of the chip breaker should be parallel to the cutting edge, and it isn't, as you can plainly see. This is because the the arches on the chip breaker are higher on one side than they are on the other. I'm going to have to try to flatten them by carefully squeezing them in a vise on one side and hope that I can get it to match the other side. Now, that worked better than I hoped. I'm going to remove the chip breaker from the plane iron now. And I'm going to take a couple swipes across the leading edge of the chip breaker so that it will rest tight against the plane iron. By the way, the uneven arch was a problem with just this chip breaker, not the second one that I bought. So this is a screw up with quality control, not manufacturing. The next problem that I found is that the lateral adjustment lever, this thing right here, isn't laterally adjusting. This is the central forge plane. As you can see, when I move the lever, the plane iron barely moves. Here's the Stanley plane from which it was copied, and there's plenty of movement. What I found is that the recess in the frog where the head of this machine bolt rests. This is the machine bolt that holds the uh, plain iron to the chip breaker. There's just barely any room for the head of that bolt. See, look at that. Barely any movement, not even a sixteenth of an inch. But here, it's nice and wide, and there's plenty of room for that bolt. It goes back and forth easily. So, I'm going to have to find out some way to widen this recess. I think I have it. I've removed the frog from the plane and I'm going to take this Dremel tool with a cutoff blade and I'm going to carefully remove some of the metal on the frog in an attempt to widen the recess. I think that might do it. Yeah, quite a bit more movement. Okay, let's stop monkeying around and put this thing back together to find out whether or not we've got a plane or a small boat anchor. While we're putting it back together, I'm going to give you 
my invaluable opinion on this tool. And that is, I really do believe that to put anything this bad on your store shelf, you run the risk of cannibalizing your customer base. Let me explain. This thing is obviously aimed at the novice, probably a first time buyer. And the uh, problems that are found are way beyond a novice's expertise in planeology. Uh, your customers are going to be dispirited, disgusted, and furious. And it's going to make them much less inclined to come back and buy more tools. And beyond the uh, monetary reasons, it's a shame because the, uh, the feeling that you get with taking a swipe with a finely tuned plane is just a joy beyond description. If woodworking were a religion, this would be our sacrament. And uh, a plane like this is a sin against craftsmanship. Okay, I'll get off my high horse and uh, let's see if this thing will actually cut some wood. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you turn a silk sear into a sow's purse. <laughs>